kid. Seriously. Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the Kids Seriously Show. We are the only podcast that has no Maya Madrid this week. Well, maybe that's actually every other podcast around that doesn't have him this week. But we certainly don't, as he is just too busy with life right now, and we hope he comes back next week. I am sitting in the A chair for, you know, one of the few times that I do that. I am Luke Neitzel, and I am joined out on the West Coast by my brother Mark Neitzel. And we are going to try to run through our arbitrary pop culture game show, talk about a TV show we've been watching, and then also come up with a topic of a week, which may or may not be soccer-related, because it's just you and me, Mark, so it's probably going to be soccer-related. I would put lots of money on that. But first off, Mark, how you doing out there, buddy? You know, I'm getting by. I'm on my second round of this head cold that I thought I'd beat. And then about uh, two nights ago, my throat just felt like it was on fire and hasn't really stopped. So, you know, I'm I'm drinking lots of water and taking Tylenol and sleeping and just trying to get through this. So you didn't so, do anything this weekend then? Um, well, let's see. We, we looked at some houses, Ooh. um, because we are in the market and we're old like that. And that's what passes for entertainment. When you get to be our age is you go to open houses and laugh at the crown moldings and the questionable fixtures that they put on cabinets. So, but other than that, no, it's been a lot of lying, low, a lot of sleeping, a lot of trying to stay hydrated. You, what you've been up to? Trying to think if I did anything. I spend most of my weekends, as I always do, at youth sporting events, which I which I enjoy. But the weekends all blend together when you're just shuffling from one gym to the next gym. I'm pretty sure I drank way too much wine last night, but I feel pretty good. So I, I'm on a little bit of a hot streak tonight, so we'll see how that plays out. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just you and me, so we're going to have to jump into our, our, our favorite thing to do, our arbitrary pop culture trivia Maya was supposed to write the questions this week, but he is, uh, as we mentioned, not able to be here. So I am going to do the one-player version of this game where I've come up with seven pop culture questions that you have to come up with immediate answers for, and I will either award you points or reject you based on nothing other than my own personal preference, because what else would you do on the internet? So we are going to get started here and see you're going to need at least four for a win. Mark, are you feeling ready? I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Ignore any coughing that may occur midway through an answer. Well, you know, good thing for editing buttons. So that's that's what we do in post, as we say in the biz, because we are professional. Question one. The box office threw us a little bit of a curve this weekend as Aquaman, the billion-dollar DC movie, was finally dethroned on the domestic box office. It was beaten by the Kevin Hart, Brian Cranston feel-good drama The Upside which I'm not really planning on seeing because it looks terrible to me, but it is a remake of a very popular and successful French movie called The Untouchables, which starred Omar Sy, which we all know and love as Bishop from his 13 seconds in X-Men Days of Future Past. But this got me to thinking, since The Untouchables was such a popular movie, what is the best American remake of a foreign language film? The best American remake of a foreign language film? film well i am going to go i i don't think you're gonna um i don't think i'm gonna get this point but i'm gonna go with what my my initial impression is and it's going to be um leon the hitman starring uh jean paul renault i think and um jean gary Reno. oldman john reno yeah uh gary oldman and natalie portman um, that was a remake of a French film, um, I think also called Leon the Hitman, and mostly memorable. One, I think this was Natalie Portman's first ever role, and two, because Gary Oldman is just so batshit over the top and seeing crazy that it makes up for any other shortcomings. Pretty decent action flick, uh, mid-90s classic, that's my answer. 
All right, so Leon the Professional is a very good movie. I do enjoy that one. Uh, Jean Reno's a little bit underrated as far as I'm concerned as an actor. He is a solid character guy, if not a leading man. I, I will award you the point, even though I wasn't aware that was a remake. I thought it was just uh, dubbing versus non-dubbing. So, But we'll let it slide, because what I had written down is, is the, the real answer is probably The Magnificent Seven, and not, not the remake of The Magnificent Seven, like the Yul True. Brenner... Uh, Steve yeah. McQueen, Magnificent Seven. That that's probably the real answer. It's a remake of Kurosawa's The Seven Samurai. I also think The Birdcage is a really good answer because I I love the shit out of that movie, and that's based on a French movie. Uh, but what we were really trying to avoid is that if you said The Departed, you would get a negative point. So mm. you you avoided that on two levels. One, The Departed is a bad movie. It's it's uh objectively bad movie and not only is it a bad movie the movie it's based on is one of the best crime thrillers ever made so uh you avoided that minefield which is what we were trying to avoid so i'm gonna let you have the points on this one and that puts you in a pretty good spot because we are starting out this game with you at one to nothing or i I suppose one out of one since you're not playing against anyone so good on you which is gonna lead, yeah. Which is gonna lead us into question two. We're gonna stay with movies, and we are gonna talk with everyone about everyone's favorite movie of the year, unquestionably the biggest success of the year. It is Sony Pictures Venom, which made over eight hundred million dollars globally. They've already greenlit the the sequel, where we're gonna see Woody Harrelson be Carnage. And it got me thinking, because Spider uh, Sony has the Spider-Man universe, where they're launching not only this Venom movie, but a Morbius movie uh, starring Jared Leto, which, you know, there's there's no way that could fail. That'll have to be oh. am- amazing. They've, they've hit box office gold this one time with this theory of doing Spider-Man villains without Spider-Man in them, which means even if Morbius fails, even if Venom 2 fails, we're going to get at least two more of these. So who is the Spider-Man character... That isn't Spider-Man or a version of Spider-Man. So not Ben Riley, not Miles Morales, since we just got that anyway. Okay. Not Spider Gwen. Who is the character in a Spider-Man in the Spider-Man universe that should be the next to get their own movie? Um. Okay. Well, first off, I wanted to say Shocker, if for no other reason than the comedic possibilities of that name. Um. But I don't know that he's really going to be able to carry a whole movie. And he was actually part of Spider-Man Homecoming. Two versions so of I, the Shocker were in Spider-Man Homecoming. Yeah. So I think um, that's going to gonna go. I'm going to go. I'm going to go with a deep cut here. And I am going to go with. Uh, I'm pretty sure in the comics there is a spider Aunt May. And who really doesn't want to see a 70 year old woman. Um, swinging uh, across buildings through downtown Manhattan. So, um, you know, this this whole universe without Spider-Man is a joke anyway. So let's not, why don't we just take the most joke character outside of Spider-Ham. So uh, I'm going with Spider-Aunt May. Well, you, you summed it up well because you, you put out there the question, who doesn't want to see a 70-year-old woman slinging around? The answer is me. I don't want to see that <laughs> at all. And the fact that they actually had a script for a Sally Field-led Aunt May spy movie makes me a little sick to my stomach. So you're not getting the point on this. The answer for me is Craven the Hunter, which is a really cool concept for a villain who could actually be played more as a hero, I think, in a better way than Venom, and as someone who could be completely independent of a spider universe. Like, he's a cool concept for a character that doesn't need Spider-Man to exist. So you could build your own thing about him, and it wouldn't seem as unnatural as making a Venom movie, making a Doc Ock movie, or a Green Goblin movie that doesn't have Spider-Man. I think Craven the Hunter could survive on his own, and we would get a guy in a half shirt with lion fur on it. And, you know, that's never a bad thing. I'm, I'm a little disappointed in how seriously you took this entire concept, when I, I, I don't think anybody should be taking this whole Sony Spider-Verse series concept series. Like. You, you say that, but Sony also gave us Into the Spider-Verse. So we... we With Spider-Man. Yeah, that's touche. Well, well said, but 
if they're going to do it, I at least want to see something that I, I'm, there might be a chance I see. And 70-year-old Spider-May is not going to cut it for me. So, hey, hey, 70-year-old Spider-May has as much chance of me seeing it as a Craven movie with Spider-Man. Or a Venom movie with Tom Hardy. Yeah, well, I, I suppose. I suppose. Regardless, you get no points. So you are one and one as we head into question three. And we are going to move into MLS. And one of the things that was announced at the MLS draft, which is something we'll be talking about more in depth later, but a big announcement was made that they have decided to name the Coach of the Year Award. It'll henceforth be known as the uh, Shiggy Smith Award. Uh, Ziggy passed away, you know, within the last few weeks. He's one of the all-time great coaches in MLS history. I, I think it's basically him and Bruce Arena are the kind of the two that separate themselves against all others. So from now on, nice honor for him. They will have the award named after him. This is not the first award that they have named after someone. The Open Cup, which isn't strictly an MLS award, has had two names. It was first named for, or, or no, I'm sorry, the uh, the MLS Cup has been named for, uh, now I'm going to blank on the guy's name. It was named for uh, the guy who helped land the 94 World Cup, but then they renamed it Lamar for Ange. Hunt. Nope, Lamar Hunt is the Open Cup, but MLS Cup was the Alan Roethlisberg trophy. Oh, yeah. And then they renamed it after Phil Anschultz, which I was disappointed they changed the name, but I, Anschultz kept the league alive when it was about to fold. So credit where credit's due. They also named yeah. the MVP award after Landon Donovan, who's probably the most impactful player in league history. One award that has not been named yet is the Golden Boot Award, which is awarded annually to the player that scores the most goals. So who, if they were to name the Golden Boot Award, should it be named after? Okay. I feel like you've you've teed me up here. So you know what I'm going to say. You've specifically formatted this question to get me to say what I'm going to say. And I'm going to say it, even though I know you've got something else out there um, and are going to immediately not give me the point, but I don't care because on this coast we stand up for what's right, and it should be the Wondolowski golden boot because Chris Wondolowski will be, after the season, the most prolific goal scorer in MLS history, uh, perennial team player, good person. Um, Donovan has the MVP award, so he doesn't need two named after him. So I can't think of a more fitting name than Wondolowski, even though you're probably going to go with Roy Laster because he was the original record holder. I'm sorry. The award is going to go to Roy Lassiter, who, yeah. who, you know, I, I like honoring league history. I like the fact that he was so far and away the best scorer in the formative years of this league and a name that, that should be remembered. And he held, you know, Wondolowski tied him along with Bradley Wright Phillips for the, the longest single season or the, the most goals in a season until this last season when Joseph Martinez, Martinez just destroyed it. Um, but Lasseter's record stood for, you know, almost 20 years, which I think is something really exciting. You know, he's also kind of a generational player. His son is now a member of the Galaxy. I think he's someone that deserves to be remembered for what he did for the league when it, it started out. And I think that would be a nice honor. I, I'm not trying to downplay Chris Wondolowski, but I really think that Chris Wondolowski is a player that's going to be remembered fondly by Quakes fans, as he should, but isn't a player that's going to be remembered throughout the rest of the league the same way. And I think he's going to be a name that I think is very comparable the difference being they switched teams is is Jeff Cunningham. Jeff Cunningham played in the league for a really long time and is, you know, third or fourth on all-time goals. Great player, worked really hard, played for a lot of different teams, but he's not a name anyone's going to go back and go, yeah, Jeff Cunningham, one of the the top 5 players that ever played in this league. And as much as I'm I'm not trying to insult Wondolowski, I just don't think he's that guy that's going to be in that group either. I think you could say the same thing about Jason Christ who was the goal scoring king for a long, long time as well. So I, I'm going to go with Lassiter. Uh, and, and I wasn't trying to set you up, even though I did have a feeling where you were going to go. But, you know, well, you knew exactly where I was going with that. Don't give me that. Hey, shit. but it, it was an interesting test too to see to see where your morals lie. So good for you for sticking to something. But you, you get no points on yeah. that. So, yeah, so I'm the Oscar Schindler of this game. 
Yeah, you you guys are very comparable people. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same kid. You you both were Nazi party members. Uh, so <laughs> moving into question four, you uh you really need to come up big here, but this is gonna fit in your wheelhouse a little better. Maybe this is a makeup question for you. Because you are down currently one out of three. We move into question four, and we're going to talk a little wrestling news. Because there is a new wrestling league starting. It is called the AEW. And it is being promoted by some people called the Khan Brothers, who apparently are wrestlers that I've never heard of. But also Cody Rhodes and Chris Jericho. And it's Mm -hmm. making some waves, and people think it could be the next big thing. But not only is it making waves in the wrestling world, it's making waves in the comic world. Because it started one of the biggest online feuds of the early 2019 year. And that is the feud between wrestling hero CM Punk and Image co-founder Rob Liefeld. Oh my. Because some people on Twitter made the comment that this new league is basically the Image Comics of wrestling. CM Punk responded on Twitter by saying, So everything is going to be late. Most books won't even come out. And also nobody can draw feet. (laughs) <laughs> Liefeld responded to this by saying, no, the late books will come out, break sales records, and create the foundation of success for a company for 27 years now. Which is a little more serious of an answer than I was hoping for for, for Liefeld. But uh, mm. what I want to know is, is, what is the dumbest thing that Image Comics has put out in its 27-year history? Oh, the dumbest thing? Mm-hmm. Well... Oh, that's, that's pretty hard to quantify. Um, this would be in my wheelhouse, but I'm actually hard pressed to think of the dumbest. Um, I mean, there was, well, no, that's, that's not true. I'm going to go with Dale Keown's pit, (laughs) which was basically a giant you know, Tope Hulk with chains all over him who had the name Pit, I think just because it sounded really cool. And a ponytail. Uh, he had a bitch in black yeah, ponytail. Oh, yes, yes, he did have black ponytail. I mean, you know, it's fashionable to to bag on on Liefeld and um you know, his his drawing style and the fact that he could put out a book, but there were actually some interesting concepts in that first young blood. I mean, he was, he was actually one of the first people to, to think of the idea as superheroes, as celebrities, um, which really, you know, was a fairly, fairly good idea for that age. And so, for the fantastic I, I, four. Hmm? And for the fantastic four. Anyways, continue. Yeah. Anyway. So, you know, I don't feel like I want to, I, I want to go with that. And and there's lots of stuff that was, you know, kind of derivative, but, uh, you know, you, you don't really forget about it. And, and I just, I, I want to go with kind of that first wave. And I think Pitt was really kind of the dumbest of that first wave. And you're leaving out the, the, the fact too, that I believe the major arc of his story was his friendship with like a six year old boy that like alien robots wanted to kidnap for whatever reason. And I think there was also an, like a robot that lived in Pitt's consciousness or something like that. Like what a mess. So the answer I had written down was the, the Levi's commercial with Rob Liefeld, but I am very willing to accept Uh, Pitt because I forgot about Pitt and that is an absolutely dumb character. (laughs) So, and I believe I had like Pitt one through four because you know, I was going to get rich off those image number ones, like the, the rest of us. So I will give you the point there which means you have leveled things it is two and two so you have wait quick question mm-hmm. but did you get the poly bagged um chrome foil covered pit one through four i didn't i wasn't a big enough believer in pith that i was gonna buy one to read mm-hmm. and one to seal so um well, see, there, i may have made that mistake went, on some other ones there there went your uh your retirement fund yeah it's all out the window now so good on you. You tied it up at two and two, which is going to move us to question five. There's no Maya here, so we need to talk a little bit of Minnesota. Minnesota is not currently good at any professional sports right now, apparently, based on the current teams. The uh, the Vikings have already missed the 2019 playoffs. The Wild look like they're going to struggle to maybe make their usual first round exit. The Wolves are horrible. I don't think there's a lot of hope for the Twins. The Lynx uh, 
our, our usual winner, but they looked like they might have an off year after losing some key players. So we need to reminisce about the good times of Minnesota sports. We need to reminisce about the all-time greats in Minnesota sports history. If we take the the four most prominent professional sports, so I'm going to leave out the Lynx, I'm going to leave out Minnesota United. We take the four the four big teams, which is the Minnesota Vikings, the Minnesota Twins, the Timberwolves slash Minnesota Lakers, and the Wild slash North Stars. I want you to pick the Mount Rushmore, one from each of those sports that you're going to put on the Minnesota Mount Rushmore. So one for the Twins, one for the Lakers slash Wolves, okay. one for the Vikings, one for the North Stars slash Wild. Okay. So we'll, we'll start with the North Stars, and that's going to be Mike Madonna. Simply because I don't know any other North Stars slash Wild, so and I remember that name. I remember him being pretty good, and I like the North Stars logo better. So he's going to be number one um, for the Timberwolves. Number number two spot, uh, obviously, it's going to be KG. Um, even though he didn't take the Timberwolves really to where they could have gone, he was still an incredible player. He was a good member of the community. Um, and I think that, you know, I, again, not a huge basketball fan either. So I'm not entirely sure who else I would pick to go in there um, other than maybe Flip Saunders. But no, we're going to go with KG. So that's that's two. Um, for the Twins, the obvious answer would be Kirby Puckett. However, uh, revelations that have come about about him afterwards um, – make it a, a little problematic to hero worship him. So uh, instead of Kirby, I am either, uh, it's a toss up between Tom Bernanski's mustache and Kevin Herbeck's waistline. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with Bruno's mustache um, as our third, um, just because goddamn that was magnificent. Uh, as far as the fourth spot, this one's really clear, okay? It's going to be Randy Moss's ass mooning Packer fans. I have to say, man, you, you made a lot of wrong turns on this question, but I think you saved yourself at the end because what what we have written down here is uh, Neil Broughton is who you would want for the North Stars slash Wild. Madonna was a good player, but he only played a couple of years in Minnesota before they moved to Dallas and also had the quote about how they never would have won anything in Minnesota and he was glad they were in Dallas. So fuck that guy. Uh, oh. Kevin, Kevin Garnett is, is by far the obvious choice. I mean, if you're going real old school Lakers like George Mikan, uh, you know, is is probably who yeah. a lot of people would say. But, you know, I wasn't alive then. So I'm, I'm going to put Kevin Garnett up there. Uh, allegations aside, I mean, they have a statue of Kirby Puckett outside. He he is the guy that would end up on there. Plus, I have I have two things. You called Ken Herbeck fat, which I'm not cool with. <laughs> And, uh, you know, as, as good as Bernanski's mustache is, he had nothing on Viola's mustache. So um, yeah. I, I can't award you there. But you're still going to get the point because I actually had written down Randy Moss mooning the Packers would be his, yeah, his position. So that, that redeemed it for you. Uh, and, and really, if you're going to pick one Minnesota athlete who's done more for actual winning and the culture and everything, it's probably Lindsey Whalen, to be honest. I mean, brought yeah. the, the Gopher women to a Final Four, won – multiple championships with the link links and is now, you know, turning the women's gophers into a winning program again. Um, well, and, and, and can I say though too, that if you had not limited it to those four sports, um, then clearly our Mount Rushmore would also include Ric Flair. Well, yes, obviously, obviously. Well, and over Mr. Perfect. Oh yes. Okay. I, 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 Mr. Perfect is my favorite, but let's be honest. He was never a 17 time world champion. Yeah, but I He's think the Mr. Greatest continental champion of all time, but he never held the the pinnacle of sports entertainment. You said that champion. perfectly. All right, <laughs> so you need to go uh, one out of the next two as we move into question six. And we're going back to movies because there was a major movie announcement. We have one of the greatest stars of the last two years kind of coming out of semi-retirement for live action movies. It is Eddie Murphy, and he is coming back in Coming to America 2. 
Now, mm. I, I don't know why they're making this movie. I don't know who's asking for this movie. And I say that because Coming to America is maybe the second funniest movie out of the entire 80s next to This is Spinal Tap. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. But I don't want this. It feels like a hollow either cash grab or trying to reclaim former glory because you have no glory currently. So my question is, what is the worst direct sequel of a comedy of a good comedy? So what, what's what, what is this coming America to that's going to suck going to be like what, what other great comedy had just a shit sequel right after it? Oh, Oh no, this is easy. It's easy. It's going to be uh clerks too. Which was a, a horribly unfunny movie featuring a couple guys who, who, quite honestly, the only reason they got to act in Clerks to begin with is because they knew Kevin Smith. Um, and it features Jay and Silent Bob, who Shtick had gotten really tired by that time, and somehow ends with a, a donkey sex show joke that just made no sense and a musical number two that featured a camera on a crane for, for no discernible reason. Um, it, it, I, I will make a, a lot of excuses and defend a lot of Kevin Smith's work. Um, I, I find him incredibly funny, but that movie was just a turd and especially disappointed coming off of clerks, which I, I don't know if clerks is necessarily the funniest movie ever made, but I don't think I have ever laughed harder at a movie than I did the first time I saw Clerks. I mean, I, I remember choking. I was laughing so hard from that film. So, so to have a sequel to that was really disappointing. So uh, Clerks 2. Ladies and gentlemen, signal the Stanley Tucci alarm. The written down answer was Clerks 2. Um, oh my God. On, on top of not being funny, it was also a panic reaction because he made Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, which... I actually think is Kevin Smith's best movie because he's not trying to say anything serious. Cause I think that's where his movies fail is that he is not a good, he can't handle serious topics. He doesn't have anything insightful to say. And Jay and silent Bob strike back is just pure dumb shit buffoonery. And that's, that's what he's good at. Um, and mm -hmm. when he made that movie, he said, this is it. I'm retiring these characters then made Jersey Girl, which was a notorious bomb, and immediately panicked and made Clerks 2 to try and yeah. get back. So that, that movie is abysmal. It's not funny. It's the lowest common denominator. I have a feeling they wrote he wrote it in probably a weekend, just trying to quickly make something to make people forget Jersey Girl. So yeah, that, that movie is horrible, and that is the answer, which means... Oh, you have claimed the victory as we coast into question seven, which is basically going to be a free space for you. Fantastic. I had to do something relatively hard this weekend. I am a parent and parenting is a very hard job. It's, it's all the cliches that they say it is. And you end up doing things that go against your soul and your moral being and you know, every instinct in your body because it, it makes your children happy and you got to let them be who they are and lead their lives. So this weekend I bought my son a Chelsea sign that he really wanted to hang up, even though I loathe Chelsea football club, but he loves Christian Pulisic. So now uh, he is a, a Chelsea fan and I'm going to have to deal with that now for the next God knows 15, <laughs> 20 years. What is the biggest concession you have made to make a loved one happy? The biggest concession I have made to make a loved one happy. Hmm. I am. I am going to have to say that every night my wife, my lovely bride, loves to fall asleep to TV that she's streaming online, and she has a very hard job. She has a very cerebral job, so that means that when she's home, she doesn't want to watch hard cerebral things. She wants to watch fluff. She wants reality TV. So that's a lot of what she winds up watching. And, and another thing, too, is that it always puts her to sleep. So when she falls, she puts these, these shows on, she'll make it about 15 minutes, and then she falls asleep in it. So then the next night, she'll put that show back on. The same episode? Oh, no. And so then she'll fall asleep again. So this will happen three, four nights in a row where I have heard 
and because I'm not actually watching it, but I'm in the bed next to her, her iPad, I have heard the exact same episode of Married at First Sight over and over and over again to the point where I can tell her things that she doesn't even know about the show because I've had it burned into my memory through rote memorization. And that, that was, that was a bit of a struggle. I, I still hear that horrible theme song in my nightmares and it, it's ongoing sacrifice too. So yes, multiple, multiple viewings of married at first sight. My God, I, just, things. just having to fall asleep to someone else's noise bothers me, let alone, I don't even know what the hell married at first sight is, but based on the title, I have some ideas on what that could be about. And that sounds horrific. Um, Luke, all of your ideas, I guarantee you, based on that title, are absolutely correct. Oh my god. Oh, America. It's, it's, it's a daring social experiment that's carried out on deep cable TV. We are definitely not a declining empire here in the U.S. <laughs> Congratulations, Mark. You are a winner. Do you have anything to say to gloat in your victory over the other person you weren't playing? I, I really hope my wife doesn't hear about that last question. Don't worry, no one listens to us.